Um enredo surpreendente, vilões e suspeitos e momentos mais que dramáticos. Poderia ser um longa de ficção, mas é um documentário com um tema explosivo. As origens e os bastidores da crise que abalou o mundo. O título já diz muito. A expressão Inside Job é usada para descrever um crime cometido com a participação de alguém que tinha confiança da vítima. Como os bancos que apostavam contra produtos que eles próprios vendiam aos clientes. Com essa abordagem corajosa, o documentarista Charles Ferguson revela os pequenos e grandes delitos, as omissões e a corrupção por trás do tsunami financeiro. Ferguson, que vem colecionando prêmios e críticas entusiasmadas, conversou com o repórter Jorge Pontual em Nova York sobre o documentário que tem estreia marcada para fevereiro aqui no Brasil. Esse papo você confere agora no Conta Corrente Especial. You tell the story of the financial crisis in five parts. So first, uh, how we got here, uh, and it starts with the deregulation of the financial si uh, system during the Reagan years, mm -hmm. but it culminates in the Clinton years with uh, the merger, the illegal merger of Citibank and Travelers Group to form Citigroup. That was made legal. So how that happened? Uh, how you show it? Well, it, it initially, actually, the, the, the merger occurred before the law was changed. And when the merger occurred, it actually was still illegal. And the Federal Reserve um, gave uh, Citigroup an exemption for one year from the provisions of the law, the Glass-Steagall Act, which had been enforced since 1934. The Glass-Steagall Act was the law passed uh, after the uh, Great Depression, which uh, separated investment banking from commercial banking and uh, and did that to stabilize the financial system and to make sure that individual bank deposits were never subject to the kinds of risks that investment bankers sometimes take. And, uh, and that law continued in force until the 1990s and, and then Uh, banks started to want to become bigger and to merge again and to acquire investment banking activities and, uh, and the, the largest of those mergers was Citigroup which created at the time uh, the largest financial company in the world and uh, during that period in the Clinton administration uh, the banking industry lobbied very hard for the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act and the Clinton administration agreed and cooperated and uh, Robert Rubin and Larry Summers, the two Treasury Secretaries of the Clinton administration, um, uh, pushed for the repeal of that law, and in 1999, it was, in fact, repealed. And your film shows how important that was to create all the, what happened later, right? Yeah, well, there were several uh, laws that were important. The, the other one, uh, which was passed also in the Clinton administration in 2000, it was actually the very last law passed in the Clinton administration was a law that actually banned the regulation of privately traded derivatives and made it possible for uh, these uncontrolled speculative um, uh, financial bets to grow in size and, and ultimately play a large part in the financial crisis. Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, they knew what was happening. The second part is the bubble itself. So uh, it was inflated by the Fed with cheap credit. Um, the banks profited by selling bad loans, bad mortgage loans. And uh, the credit rating agencies were complicit. So it was like a perfect storm. And, uh, and you show how one of the main actors, one of the main villains in your cast of villains, was Alan Greenspan. Right? Yes, uh, Alan Greenspan unfortunately bears a lot of responsibility for what occurred uh, in two ways. First of all, he kept interest rates um, extremely low for a long period of time, even after it was clear that there was a bubble. And uh, probably even more importantly, he refused to regulate the financial services industry. The Federal Reserve not only sets interest rates in the United States, it also has very important regulatory powers. And since, in fact, since 1994, the Federal Reserve has had the legal power to regulate the mortgage industry, which was the industry that was most at fault in, in causing the bubble. 
and he refused. And in fact, there were no regulations whatsoever uh, regulating the mortgage industry throughout the entire bubble. There's one thing that I remember in the film, uh, a deposition of someone from the SEC, I think, saying that there was one guy who would turn off the light when he left the office because he was the only regulator for some one of the areas. For risk management, yes. The, uh, risk management, the main thing. Uh, yes, yes. There was quite one person. There was one person at the Securities and Exchange Commission who was in charge of monitoring the risk posed by the investment banks. Uh, there had been a larger group of people, but uh, enforcement and regulation were gutted, uh, were eliminated during that period, both by the Bush administration in general and specifically by the SEC. When it happened, when the bubble burst, the government said, uh, many actors in the government said, uh, it's a surprise, we didn't see it coming, who could ever imagine that something like that would ever happen? But you show that there's like a cast of Cassandras, people who were warning long before that you interviewed for the film, for instance, uh, Nuria Rubini, but there are others, right? Yes. So what was happening that uh, they didn't want to hear the warnings? What do what you think happened there? Well, I, I think that there were a number of reasons that these warnings were ignored. Uh, part of it was ideology. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of these people sincerely believed that unregulated markets always performed well and they couldn't imagine that this kind of thing could happen. There was also, though, a lot of political convenience and also a lot of corruption. Um, the political convenience was that, that during a bubble, everybody's very happy and politicians get reelected. Um, uh, during a bubble, before a crash, uh, asset prices are growing, people are getting wealthier, the mm -hmm. economy's growing, so everybody thinks life is great. Um, but there was also quite a lot of corruption. There, there uh, were people who knew that this was a problem, but they were paid to look the other way. So what you show when you talk about corruption, and the title of the film is Inside Job, meaning that uh, the supposed victims are actually the, the criminals, right? So it's like the, the bankers are the robbers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In a way, that's what you're saying with your title. Yes. So how was that possible? How did the, the financial industry that grew so much after deregulation manage to control, uh, in a way, to control the U.S. government and to be so influential? Well, it, uh, it happened gradually. It happened over uh, a 25, 30 year period. Mm -hmm. It started in the 1980s. Um, the, the beginnings of it were that uh, there were, in fact, some important forces, the computerization of banking being one of them, uh, the increased volatility of financial markets being another because of the oil shocks of the 1970s. For various reasons, there were legitimate pressures um, uh, for the financial services industry to modernize and probably to become somewhat more concentrated and for regulation to change. But what happened was that as the financial services industry became more powerful, it began using its greater power and its greater wealth to corrupt the political system. And, and that cycle just got worse and worse. So uh, as the financial services industry became more powerful, it contributed more money to politicians which led to loosened regulation, which led to yet more power on the part of the financial services industry, which led it to give even more money to the political system. And so by the time we get to the financial crisis, uh, the financial system, the financial industry in the United States had really gotten completely out of control. It, it was no longer effectively regulated. It often engaged in criminal behavior. It, it was obscenely profitable. Uh, the year before the crash, uh, financial services accounted for 40% of all corporate profits in the United States, mm. which is crazy, mm. crazy, and uh, and also dangerous, as we saw with what happened. The, the bubble bursts, and it's interesting that you show uh, Christine Lagarde, the, the finance minister of France, saying that she warned, she asked Hank Paulson, the treasury secretary, uh, there's a tsunami coming, and we are talking about uh, what uh, swimsuit we are going to wear. And he said, no, nothing is going to happen. Yes. And then he made the decision. Uh, it, it was in stages, as you show, but uh, the main thing was the, the, the failure of uh, Lehman Brothers, because that brought down the whole financial system in a day. Yes. 
uh, and how was that decision taken? And you show it was, wasn't even prepared. There was no planning. It, there was no planning. It, it, it's an amazing story. I actually wish that we could have put more about that mm. into the film because we have a lot of interviews with a lot of people who were mm. involved in it. Uh, there, there was literally no planning for Lehman's bankruptcy um, in several different senses. So first of all, there was no legal planning for a bankruptcy. And a bankruptcy of something like Lehman Brothers is a very complicated thing that requires a lot of preparation. Uh, but secondly, the government had not planned for what would happen if Lehman were to go bankrupt. And they hadn't studied Lehman's connections with the rest of the financial world. And so everything that, in fact, did happen came as a surprise to them. And it shouldn't have. They, they could have and they should have known that a Lehman bankruptcy would have major effects on these other financial markets, on the money market funds, on the commercial paper market, on hedge funds because Lehman's London office would have to be closed under British law and all the assets in the London office would be frozen, which meant that people who owned those assets couldn't get them back, which caused panic in the private financial markets. So these things could have been known, uh, but there was no planning and the Treasury Department and Mr. Paulson did not consult with any foreign governments before this happened. Uh, and that also contributed mm -hmm. to the problem. When were you first told that Lehman, in fact, was going to go bankrupt? Uh, after the fact. After the fact? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, then comes part four, accountability. And here, Goldman Sachs, uh, we see the chair, Blankfein, uh, at uh, a hearing being questioned by Senator Carl Levin. Levin. And it's funny because Carl Levin suddenly appears in the film as the, the adult. The, <laughs> finally, there's adult supervision. Someone who is like uh, the principal asking, uh, you know, the children, what, y what have you been doing, right? Uh, and the attitude of Blank Fine is like dismissive and a little disrespectful and uh, apparently clueless. W what do you see in that? Uh, it's amazing. It's a, it's a very important piece of. It was on C-SPAN, right? You took it from C-SPAN so yes. everybody could see it. What do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap? Does that bother you as a hypothetical? No, this is real. It was public. Yeah, the, the hearings were public and they, and they were televised, but, but only a couple of hundred thousand people typically watch. Uh, yeah, it brought, brings down the house during your film. The theater laughs because it's, it's like slapstick. Yes. But it's tragic at the same time. Yes. And, and quite outrageous, yeah. It's, quite, it's an amazing thing, yeah. So what was uh, Goldman Sachs' excuse there when Levin asked, what, what, what will you do? Because Goldman Sachs, as you show, was betting against the, the securities that they were selling. Yes, Goldman Sachs uh, did two quite outrageous things during this period. One was that it bet against the securities that it was selling. So they to were betraying as, their clients. Yes, they were betraying their clients. And, and the other very similar thing that they did was uh, they went through their own holdings and they kept those securities that they thought were high quality and the low quality ones they sold to other people. And, and, and both of those things are discussed in this, in this uh, Senate hearing. We're sorry, we won't do it again. Trust us. Well, I have some people in my constituency that actually robbed some of your banks. Goldman tried to pretend that it was being just a, a neutral market maker mm -hmm. and allowing people to buy and sell whatever they wanted to buy and sell. No, they claim it's not illegal. That is a complicated thing. I, it, one big surprise to me when I was making this film was to learn that in fact it is not automatically legal to bet against the securities not that illegal. you're selling. It's not automatically illegal. It's just unethical maybe. It certainly is very unethical. <laughs> but also as a practical matter uh, I strong and many people not just me many people strongly suspect that there was criminal behavior here because to, to do that, to, to sell securities that 
you intend to fail and you're betting against so that you you're going to be profiting from that so that you can profit from their failure to do that while being honest to all of your customers is very difficult mm. and so if it involves fraud if they lied then that's fraud mm. and i you know I, i think many people strongly is there any investigation uh, on that we don't know we don't know uh, there have been no criminal charges filed against any financial executive or any investment bank in the last two years uh, not a not a single executive of goldman sachs or any other investment bank mm -hmm. has been charged with a crime why did you uh, decide to go into the personal and moral aspects of the behavior of the wall street honchos prostitution drugs um, why why go into that there were two reasons that i that i wanted to go into that the first reason is that that i think was part of they are becoming totally disconnected from the consequences of their actions you know they they surrounded themselves with this artificial world um composed of people and things that they paid for and that they could therefore control and and it got you know ridiculously extreme the the private elevators you know in the film we talk about um Richard Fold's private elevator at Lehman Brothers. He wasn't the only one. Uh, Stan O'Neill at Merrill Lynch had a private elevator also. And, and the way that his private elevator worked was he told his employees, whatever elevator I get into in the morning, you have to get out so that it'll be just me. And you know, so it got very extreme. And the drugs and the prostitution were part of that, were part of the way that, that these people disconnected themselves from, you know, normal life mm -hmm. and normal and criticism and, you know, I if you or I were to, you know, get into a car and start driving 100 miles an hour in a city, you know, the police would stop us or we'd get into a crash, you know, but that didn't happen to these people because they had so much money mm -hmm. that they could live this, you know, mm -hmm. artificial life. That was one reason. The other reason is that if you really wanted to get these people then you could because everybody knows that prostitution and cocaine use are epidemic on Wall Street everybody does it and that you know if if you wanted to get people to talk you could mm -hmm. and the the excuse that's frequently given as to why nobody has been prosecuted mm -hmm. is that these cases are hard to crack and you can't get people to talk in your first film on Iraq there's the same thing You show how the authorities who invaded Iraq had no plan, so the same kind of incompetence and irresponsibility. But there's a sadness to, to, to it, to this perception in the first film. In the second, there's anger. Yes. 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 You know, I, uh, the, the Iraq war, different people have different views about that war, of course. My, my own view is that primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, it was a well-intentioned but horrific tragedy and and something that was terribly terribly mismanaged whether whether or not you believe that it was just to start the war in the first place um, it, it was terribly mismanaged in a, in a tragic way that that didn't come mainly from naked self-interest uh, but this was just yeah. that's the difference yes and this was just you know the financial thing was yeah people wanted to make money and they didn't care what it did well now finally part five uh, which is the saddest where we are now and you showed that um, Obama lost the chance to change things uh, and that it's actually a Wall Street government yes unfortunately very sad uh, I think how did that happen yeah oh. I don't know. You know, I uh, there have been several explanations proposed um, about why Mr. Obama acted as he did when he was elected. Um, one is that it, it just personally, emotionally, he's very averse to conflict. He's not a fighter. He's not a fighter. He's a compromiser. Uh, another explanation is that he had very little experience with economics, finance, mm -hmm. or business when he was elected, and so he was uh, the prisoner of the people who surrounded him mm -hmm. I remember that uh, he, he claimed that he wanted to have continuity not to break the confidence of the markets so and that's what we got continuity the same people yes yes that is true 
and and that might also be part of the explanation is that is that the people around him persuaded him that he needed to do this in order to reassure the financial industry and the financial markets to prevent panic. Um, and then there's also the possibility that he just made the same cold-blooded political calculation mm. that other presidents have made, mm. that this was too powerful an industry to fight. But what about the financial reform that he pushed against the opposition of the Republicans and the financial industry lobbyists? Finally, something happened. Something was voted. But uh, how do you rate that reform? It's a very weak law, uh, and, and it's likely to be weakened even further. What the law basically does in many different areas is it gives existing regulators new powers if they choose to use them. So we don't know yet what these new regulations are going to be. They're going to come out over the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the people who run these agencies now and given the way the Obama administration has been, most of us are not very optimistic. Mm -hmm. You opened the film with the tragedy of Iceland. It's really a tragedy that what happened in Iceland. But now there's uh, the tragedies of Greece and Ireland, and next is Portugal and Spain. Hope not, but could be. France and Britain have riots on the streets. So the breaking up of Europe, the European Union is threatened, the Euro is threatened. Uh, is that the next chapter? Maybe, yes. Uh, we don't know how that's going to end, but, but yes, um, several European countries are in very, very bad shape, partially because of this, partially for other reasons. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, Europe is very troubled right now. And here, since nothing uh, fundamentally changed, could that happen again? Yes. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's very striking that since the United States began deregulating its financial system in the 1980s, uh, the United States has had uh, a significant financial crisis r roughly approximately once every 10 years. The first one was in the late 1980s. Uh, there, was a, there was a stock market crash in 1987, and there was also uh, a crisis in the savings and loan industry mm -hmm. in the late 1980s in the United States. And then in the late 1990s, um, there was the dot-com bubble, there was the Asian financial crisis, uh, there was the long-term capital management affair in 1998, and then 10 years later we had this crisis. And so we're not going to have a crisis again tomorrow morning, but in another 10 years when people have forgotten, when there's some new exotic financial innovation that people are misusing, uh, yes, I fear that we could have this again. What's our next project? I don't know yet. No? I don't know yet. I have several ideas. I haven't decided. Oh, Thank you, sir. You Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for much. your interest in the interview. Uh, this is for a uh, special financial. We have a financial program. So we have this special. At the end of the year, special. I'm very honored. So since it's for a uh, more uh, financial audience, people who follow this financial program,